Welcome to Dying a Natural Passage. I'm Denise Cope, and I have been a registered nurse for 45 years and a hospice nurse for probably 25 to 26 years. And in the process of becoming a, or being a hospice nurse, I realized that the most important thing I do as a hospice nurse when I started looking at all the things I do, the pain management and comfort and, you know, making sure everything's good for them physically, that actually the most important thing I do as a hospice nurse is to normalize the dying process, to normalize it for the family and for the person that's dying if they need it. But what I've learned is that we all know how to die. And so so often it's the family that needs the help, much more so than the persons that die. And they need support, but the family really needs help in having the process normalized. So I wanted to just start out with a little overview about the dying process. Um, we have the traditional medical model that permeates pretty much the, our Western society, and that is that death is a failure, things are going wrong, and death should be avoided or fought against at all costs. Now, fortunately, that's changing. Fortunately, there is a, there's been a movement. It started out with the hospice movement here in America, well, actually back in England in about 1966, 64, 65, in England, Dame Cicely Saunders revived hospice and started that happening in England. And then we started the first hospice in the United States in 1973. And it started out with all volunteers. And I'm sure that most people at this point in their lives have heard of hospice. So it's grown quite a bit. But the traditional medical model is still what permeates healthcare at this point. Fortunately, we do have hospice and palliative care now, and that, in that particular model, what we know is that, ev that death is not a failure. Death is not a failure. And everything is going right, not wrong. And if there is a problem with pain, or what we perceive as suffering, that that can be worked with and comfort provided. Pain management, people who work in hospice and palliative care are superbly expert at managing pain management and any other discomfort that may come along with the disease process. So it's really important, as I think about it, to say it doesn't hurt to die. Dying is not painful. And it's really important that people understand that because they're so afraid of the suffering and the pain and what dying's going to feel like. And the truth of the matter is the disease that brings us to dying may create pain or discomfort. But dying itself actually is not painful. I cannot tell you how many people I have journeyed with through their death and they were not in pain. My stepmother just died two years ago. She fell and she broke her hip and she was 98 and a half years old and still living by herself and still driving her car and she was in wonderful cognitive and relatively good physical condition and she fell and broke her hip and by the time we got out to California we went to see her, my sister and I and her niece and she looked at us and she said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through all this rehab. I don't want to go through all this effort. I'm done. Take me home. Put me on hospice. Take me home. I'm ready to die. So we did. We took her home, put her on hospice. It took her two months. She died very peacefully, very comfortable. There was no pain involved once her surgery healed up. So it's really important to know that when we're dying, things are going right. It's not a failure. And it's a very natural project or a na very natural process. And it's also important for us to know that so very often we, the living, project upon the dying what we think they're going through. And so often we see suffering where suffering is not happening. And part of that is because we look at them through the eyes of a living body. 
and we go, oh my God, that they must be miserable. They must be so thirsty. They must be so hungry. They're dying of thirst. They're dying of starvation. Oh my God, there's just, it must be just horrible to just be laying in the bed. We keep seeing discomfort because we're looking through the eyes of a living body. And we imagine what it would feel like to us. The truth of the matter is they are in a dying body and they're having a very different experience of their body. And that goes back to the fact that we know how to die and we know how to surrender into it. It's just hard for those who are beside them and walking with them to kind of let go and, make, and believe that everything's okay. Dying is actually this n exquisitely natural, well-orchestrated process. It is so natural. We know how to die. And in fact, the other thing that I've learned, and I learned it from my animals, is that dying is actually a mammalian experience. It's what all mammals do. And it actually parallels pregnancy and birth. So that there's a pregnancy to dying, there's a labor to dying, and then there's the deathing instead of the birthing. So you think about it. We, I don't know about most people, but I know where, where did I learn about pregnancy and birth? I learned about it watching mammals, watching kitties, kittens and puppies come into the world. I learned it from animals and not one person has come into this earth without going through pregnancy, labor, birth. That's how we all got here. And when it comes to dying, we're all going to go through the same process, whether we're four-legged or two-legged. We're going to go through the same physiologic process. So it's really interesting that we come in on a, in a natural process and we go out in a natural process. So when people often, so very often people say to me, how do I know if my loved one's dying? How do I know? And my question to them is, have they ch has your loved one changed their relationship to food? Because that's the first thing that the body does when it's preparing to die. We start to change our relationship to food. Our appetite changes. And there's so much behind that. And it gets scary for family members because they're afraid, oh my God, they're not eating. And when I go in as a hospice nurse, one of the first things the family members say to me is, I don't know what to do. We've been feeding them their favorite foods and, and, and they won't eat them anymore and we just can't figure out what to feed them. And that's very often the first work I have to do as a hospice nurse is to let them know that it's okay that their loved one's not eating. Now, if we look at the bigger picture, what is that about? If we look at our, the fact that our body knows how to die. One of the things is when we, the different diseases, that what, we are hardwired. We are hardwired as human beings to live as long as humanly possible. We're hardwired for life. And when we start getting to the end of our life, not eating and drinking actually serves to prolong our life. And you go, whoa, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't add up. But if you start thinking about a disease process, it really does. When people have end-stage heart disease or end-stage lung disease, their body is going to focus on how do I get the energy to have the next heartbeat or the next breath. It's not into digesting food. It's not into nourishing the body. It's because digesting food can actually be taxing to the body. So the fact that they only eat, you know, in nursing school, we were taught with end-stage lung and end-stage uh, end stage lung and end-stage heart, only f give them frequent small feedings. So they, because their bodies really can't handle digesting a regular meal. So that's end-stage heart disease. And you'll find with other diseases, Parkinson's, and sometimes just dying. When people are just dying, their appetite drops off. That's how the body starts to withdraw from that energy that takes life force energy to, to, um, to support. Now, the other thing, and I'm going to use this information very carefully, and I put it out to people and say, use this information very, very carefully when I start looking at food as related to people who are dying with cancer. 
One of the things that has been shown is that when people are in late stage cancer and are, are moving toward the end of their life, their taste buds actually change. Food stops tasting good. The body actually has the wisdom to stop feeding the body like it normally would if things tasted, tasted good and there was an appetite. And you go, what is this about? What is that about? Well, what, we have, what, what they have found, and they've done studies on this, that when you are eating and you are an end-stage cancer, I'm not talking about early cancer or when you're being treated for cancer and you really are t still trying to support life. It's not about that. that. That stage of living needs to be supported through nutrition. But when it's clear that people with cancer are reading, reaching the end of their life, food, the body actually withdraws from wanting to eat because on one level, it's not wanting to feed the cancer. And, and they did studies back, and they've done studies since, but the one that struck me the most was when people were dying of AIDS. And they took some people, because that was a ter horrific way to die, and a lot of times it was a cancer. And what they did back then in the 80s, because there wasn't as much wisdom as there is now, is they started doing what TPN, or artificial feeding through the vein of very heavy nutrients to keep feeding that person who could no longer eat naturally. So they overrode the body's natural instinct. And what they found when they did that, they divided the groups up and half of them had gotten the artificial feeding and half of them had not. And those who had gotten the artificial feeding died sooner than the people who had been left to their natural process. So we really have to consider our bodies know how to die. We have to listen to the body and listen to what the person's wanting and not try to override that. It's really important. Now, as I say that about end-stage cancer, I want everybody to use that information with the utmost respect that food at the end of life is about quality of life. And if somebody wants to eat, don't be afraid to let them eat. Food at the end of life is about quality of life. And so when I go in, in a hospice situation, it's end of life, I don't say, oh, well, they don't need to be eating. They're just feeding their cancer. I go in and say, I know it's really hard for you that they don't want to eat anymore. But their body has a wisdom about what it wants to do and not do. And the most important thing you can do as the person who loves them and wants them to be comfortable is to listen to what they want and not try and figure out how what you want is better than what they're wanting. So it's really listening to the person who's dying. And by listening, I mean listen deeply. Listen with your heart, listen with your ears, listen with your eyes, listen with your whole intuition. But listen to them and let them take the lead because they'll tell you when they're hungry. And they'll tell you when they're not. I had one patient, this guy was delightful. He was in his 50s. He was dying of lung cancer. And he'd actually had it for 20 years, which is pretty unusual. And uh, he was a gourmet cook. And so when I go in to see him, he was this wonderful attorney. And when I go in to see him, he'd tighten his belt and show me how much more weight loss he'd had. And... Um, and he said, you know, and that's the other thing is that the appetite comes and goes. It comes and goes. So he said, you know, when I've got my appetite, he said, boy, I'm in my car and out to my favorite restaurant as fast as I can get there. <laughs> he said, because I want to enjoy some food. But the rest of the time, I'm fine with not eating. And so that's, that's the part we need to listen to and to respect. And if they are, I have had so many patients who had cancer and they were dying. They said, you know, today I had an appetite for something and it even looked good on the plate. And then when I put it up to my mouth, I couldn't put it in. The body would not let it go in the mouth, even though they thought they wanted it. Our bodies know what we want. And, and, and when we're dying, we know how to listen to our bodies. So it's a pretty amazing process. So we really have to honor what, what's happening around food. And it's really important to know that people are not starving to death when they're dying. It's just really important to know that. And then what's really important to do is to figure out 
other ways to nurture. So then you have to figure out, well, if I can't feed, because if you think about it, the word nutrition and nurture all come from the same place. It's about nurturing life. So with the life that's, that's left, whatever amount of time that is, what are some other ways to nurture since food is out of the equation? Well, you can nurture through music. You can nurture through touch. You can nurture through going through photo albums and doing life review with people and just going, going through memories. I mean, going through those albums and going like, do you remember this time? Or tell me about this time. Or asking people, if you haven't known this person for a long time and don't know much about their history, you can say, so what were some of the favorite times in your life? What are your, some of your most precious memories, things that you are most glad you did? So having the music there, some people like to have poetry read to them. Some people like to have the Bible read to them. It's all unique unto the person. Again, listening to them and finding out what's important to them. I, and I always think of this fellow when I, when I talk about this part. There was one fellow and he was critically ill with heart disease in the hospital, in the ICU, IVs going, drugs going. And he said, I just want to go home. And the doctor said, if we disconnect you from all this, you're going to die. You won't even get out of the hospital. He said, I just want to go home. So we said, okay. We, and we were the hospice at the time. And so we said, okay, we will get you home. So we got him an ambulance. They disconnected him. We got him home. And amazingly, he didn't die in the ambulance. We got him home. The only thing he wanted to do was rearrange his tackle box. <laughs> that was what was most important to him. <coughs> So we got him home, he got his tackle box rearranged, and he died two days later at peace. So figuring out what is nurturing that person when you can't do the food, that's what's really important. And one of the deepest ways that we can nurture people is to just be with them. To be with them in silence, to be with them in presence. Um, so often, I, I've noticed there's this generational thing that we, uh, who, people who are in their 60s and 70s, and even some of the people in their 80s and 90s, but most people uh, um, up to their 70s and, and into their 80s now, we want to talk about our life experiences and what it's about and what's the meaning. And, and I had this one, this was about 10 years ago, so if you move that whole chronology back 10 years, this woman called me and she said, my mother's dying and I want to know what to do. You know, our father died suddenly and, and mother's dying now and we really want to talk to her about it and she won't talk to us. And what can we do? How can we get a conversation going? And I said, well, I know that you want to talk to her and I know it's really important for you, but I'm also hearing that she's not really wanting to do that. And I have to say, it's her death. And so I think the best way to support her is to, to listen to her and hear that she's not really interested in talking. So find other people to talk to, perhaps the hospice workers, perhaps your siblings, if you have brothers and sisters to talk to, find other people to talk to. And so she said, okay. And so then she emailed me about, oh, about a week later. And she said, I'm sitting here in my mom's room and she's just laying in the bed and her favorite thing is to have me sitting in the room quietly with her and she can hear the click, click, click of the laptop keys. Uh -huh. That's all. She needed her daughter's presence. She didn't need the conversation. So if we can honor that and just be respectful that we need to be with them where they are. So I had, I had referenced that there's a pregnancy to dying and I, I kind of want to draw the parallels here. One of the things, now I have to say I've never been pregnant but I've learned a lot from all my women friends who have. And I do know that when, people, that when women are pregnant, there <clears throat> is a natural protective change in relationship to food. Especially in the first months, the first weeks of pregnancy, there is the nausea and the vomiting and the appetite changes. And they've found out that that's very protective to this newly forming fetus. That it keeps the mother from taking in toxins that might harm that cell dividing fetus at its most critical time. So the food that they don't, that's not, that's 
you know, the relationship to food that changes in early pregnancy and the relationship to food that changes at the end of life are both protective. They're both protective. <clears throat> the other thing that I, I know that naturally happens when people are dying is that they start to be less engaged in the physical world and they start to become more internal. And what's going on out there isn't nearly as interesting as it used to be. And from the mamas I've talked to, once they find out they're pregnant, what's going on in here is much more important than what's going on out in the world. There are such parallels through this whole process. And midwives who come into hospice work and end-of-life care work say, this is the same process. Oh my God, this is the same process. So it's just, it helps me to, you know, just value the fact that it's a natural process. So this natural inclination to go inward, we're normally social animals and, and we have several circles of friends. We have you know, our social circle where we might see people that we've known in the community and we say hello in the grocery stores or when you see them. I, I went to um, a performance the other night and saw people I haven't seen in a long time and they're part of that, ex, that outer circle. And then we have a, a closer circle of people that we really are close to and, and stay, spend more social time with. And then we've got that closer circle where they're really our best friends and then we've got our core circle. And those are the people that we don't have to expend social energy to be with. These people we kind of have to put on a nice face and maybe not if we're really ticked off, you know, we have to kind of restrain ourselves. But when we're with the core, we get to be real and authentic. And as we're dying, we start drawing in and drawing in and drawing in. And by the end, our energy, it's part of that energy conservation again, trying to live as long as possible, save that energy, we get down to where we only want to be with our core people, the people we don't have to put on a happy face for. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. For the early stages of dying, the early stages of pregnancy, if for the caregivers, it's important to know, first of all, to let the dying take the lead and to provide any comfort measures that are needed. And to also, what's really important is as the family is working through their, their need to feed, because we do, just, just like the body's not needing food anymore, we as beloveds who are used to nurturing through food have a need to feed. And once it gets kind of clear to us that food is not nurturing anymore and that we have to let go of that, then we're faced with the reality of this person's really dying. Because as long as they're eating, we have hope. You know, oh, can I get you to eat a little something? Because then we know we're nurturing life. But when we accept the fact that food is not the main way to take care of anymore and that there are other ways to nurture, then we have to deal with our own grief about the truth of the matter that our loved one is dying. And that's a real shift. And that's, as a hospice worker, I watch when I go in and explain about the relationship to food, then I'm also needing to explain about, you know, be with them and support them in, whoa, wait a minute, I didn't think this is where we were. So um, really processing that need to feed and help them figure out alternate ways to nurture. And also at this point, people, once they understand that they're dying, they so often want to explore, what does this mean? Oh my God, I'm really counting my life in months rather than years. What does this mean? Um, I'm working with a person right now. And, you know, if she said, if I can just have four months, that, that will be great. And so, you know, four months feels huge to her. So it's helping her process during these four months, what has her life meant? And what does it mean to be coming to the end of her life? So just really being present to what kind of support they need. And sometimes um, people start to want to go back to spiritual or religious roots. Um, usually that comes up on some level. Sometimes it doesn't come up at all. It all depends on the person's orientation, their belief system. Um, I have seen people who, um, you know, they may not have gone to church for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden, 
You know, I think I'd like to see a priest now. There was this one, oh, I love this woman. I started taking care of her when she was 99 and she died when she was 101. And she was, I mean, her hair was still natural color. She had, didn't even dye her hair. She was just delightful. And she was, she was being kept alive by injections that kept her anemia from, from killing her. Um, so she decided to stop the injection. She said, I, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm 101. Yep, let me out of here. So we stopped the injections, and I said, well, you know, it would probably be really good if we can put you on hospice. And, and these are the things that hospice can provide. They provide nurses and social workers and, and a physician and aides and a chaplain, and there's all these different people. And so I went down the list, and then I said, so who, who, do you th who would you, what do you think you'd first like from hospice? She said, I want the minister to come and hold my hand and say a prayer with me. Now, she, I had known her. She had lived in Santa Fe for at least the last 12 years of her life. She had never gone to church. She had never had anything to do with religion. But when she'd been a younger woman and married to her husband back in California, the church had been an important part of her life. And she knew now, in her heart and her mind, she was going to join her husband. And all she wanted was to hold the hand of the minister and say a prayer. And it just depends on the, on the belief system. I do know that there was, um, there was one woman or, uh, who said, you know, I need to see a priest or I need to see a minister. I forget what denomination she was. She said, I don't really believe in God, but I better get right with him just in case. <laughs> so it comes up in all different ways for people as far as getting, getting right with God. It, or for us in hospice, our chaplains are non-denominational and, f and what we know is that it's not necessarily religious issues that come up, but spiritual issues. What has been the meaning of my life? What is my relationship to the bigger picture of life? So it's much more of those spiritual, what life meaning questions, though that tends to come up. And so any issues and concerns, that's the other thing that we deal with this, um, as soon as people get onto hospice. And I do have to say, the sooner people get onto hospice, the better. So often people think hospice is for when you're laying in the bed and almost ready to take your last breath. And I really think it's important for people to know that the minute people know that they have a life-limiting disease that means their life is probably count being counted in months rather than years, they need to explore being on hospice because the sooner a person gets on hospice, the more support they can have. And I cannot tell you how many families say, oh my God, I wished we'd gotten on hospice sooner. We hear that over and over and over. And the societal view is either it's a death sentence and I don't want to do it, or I, I didn't think it was time for hospice. So it's something to explore with your doctor and explore with your friends and see where, if you have a loved one who's in that dying process, when is it appropriate to get onto hospice? So though that's all the early stages of pregnancy. So let's move into the mid stage of pregnancy and dying. Um, again, the appetite's gonna have changed. They're not gonna wanna eat those. The heavy foods are usually out of the picture. And it's interesting that the foods <laughs> that people don't want to eat at this point are all those foods we shouldn't be eating anyway. They are not interested in meat. They're not interested in anything that's really heavy and hard to digest. Um, but what they do like, what seems to be consistent through the end, ice cream ha ha gets a big gold star. Um, so those foods that are easy to digest and easy to applesauce, you know, mashed potatoes, soft cereals, but even those very soon can become too hard to digest, but that's, that's the progression. But just those softer, easier to chew, and they'll maybe only want a few bites, but just let them take the lead and just work with them about what tastes good to them. Um, and continue to do the alternate ways of, of nurturing. But they're gonna be getting a little bit weaker, a little bit more tired, spending more and more time sleeping. And you know, when we see people sleeping, I know I did this when I saw my father, well, I was 28 years old when my mother was dying and, and she'd do a lot of sleeping. And I thought, oh, well, they're just sleeping. 
what they're actually doing, I've learned now, and everything that I've learned and that I'm talking about, I've learned from my patients and from my families. Because I didn't know this information when I was taking care of my mother. I've learned it from all my patients and families. And what I know is that sleeping is so important because people are doing the hard work of dying. Dying is really hard work. It's such hard work. But it's an internal hard work. It isn't hard work like going out and doing the gardening. It's internal hard work. And that sleep is very restorative. I had this one woman, oh God, she was just so precious. And she's always with me when I'm teaching and she always, I know she wants me to tell her story. She had pancreatic cancer and it went undiagnosed for years. And part of the reason for that is that usually cancer is active in the body anywhere from, used to be three to 10 years is what they'd say. And now they found out that pancreatic cancer actually might be active in the body for 20 years before it's diagnosed. New studies have come out, but it, it doesn't really show itself until a certain point. So she hadn't been feeling well for a while. And then finally the symptoms constellated enough that they gave her a diagnosis. She went home. She had no family here. She had a son and grandchildren in Hong Kong, and she had a son on the East coast in uh, New York. And so she was here and she, oh, she was such a pistol. She was such a pistol. I th she had come from New York and I think she had con converted to Catholicism just, just, um, well, she was very active in the Catholic church, very devoted Catholic. And, and so one of the things I ta I was talking to her about her dying as soon as she got from home from the hospital. And she said, you know, I realize now I've been dying for a while and I didn't know it. She looked back on it and she said, what I look back on is, you know, this is the first winter because I started taking care of her in February. She said, this is the first winter where I didn't feel like making a fire. I just wasn't interested. And she could look back in hindsight and see how things had been happening. She just hadn't picked up on it. So eventually she got to the place where she, she didn't want caregivers coming in and taking care of her, even though she had fam people that would do that. She was very private. She eventually went into a nursing home and I went to see her in the nursing home. And um, she said, ugh, she said, I just, I'm sleeping all the time. I'm sleeping all the time. And so I said, okay, well maybe it's the medications. And I was a young nurse at that time and really didn't understand the process. So I called her doctor up and I said, is there something we can give her to wake her up because I think it's the meds. And so they gave her some medication that made her more alert. I went in to see her the next day and I said, well, how are you doing? I was so pleased that she could be awake now. And she said, "Ugh, I can't sleep. And I said, but, but you were sleeping too much. She said, oh, but that sleep, it's so important. And she didn't know it until she didn't have it. And that is the last time I tried to correct the fact that somebody was sleeping all the time. So it's really important to, and you know, once we understand and we can normalize this process, I think that we as a culture are going to be able to support what's happening instead of trying to fix each little piece that looks like it's going wrong. So again, supporting that decreasing energy and letting people sleep as much as they need to. Now, the other thing that I've learned is that dying happens on a physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual level. It happens on all those levels. And I have come to understand, again, from talking with my patients and my families and, and making some observations, that that sleep, during that sleep, we are actually starting to make those connections with the spiritual realm, the spiritual experience. Now, for people who don't believe in anything spiritual, and I do have people in my classes that don't, they are quite clear, you know, if you can't see it, touch it, measure it, feel it, doesn't exist. And they're very scientific, and I go, that's fine. What we do know scientifically is there is a physical realm, and there's a non-physical realm. We know that. So, what I have learned is that for me, the non-physical realm is a spiritual realm. For other people, it's just a scientific fact. And what I know is that when we die, we move into this space. So when we're doing that sleeping, I really believe that what we're doing is starting to do through our dream work connections with the non-physical.
So that sleep that's happening, that increased sleep, is so important and needs to be supported. And of course, I can remember when my aunt was dying and I dropped by to see her and she goes, oh God, where's Dr. Kevorkian when you need him? These kids are trying to get me out of the bed and do things and eat and I don't want to do any of that. I said, okay, Ann, let me go out and talk to him. They were trying to get physical therapists in there and make her better. And so I went out and I said, you know, I think I hadn't seen her in, in years and years and years and years. So I just went out and I said, you know, I think this is from talking to Ann, this is where she is. And they went, oh. And then I got in my car and drove on because I was driving across the country. And my other cousin called to tell me it was so perfect. They called hospice in and she died in six days very peacefully and very comfortably because they lined up with what she was needing instead of trying to do, make her do what they were needing. We so have to listen to them. So supporting that decreasing energy, allowing, you know, do the same kinds of alternate nurturing things, but do those things that work for them. If you're gonna play music, play the music they like to hear. You know, I walk through these nursing homes and they're playing, you know, 60s and 70s music and they've got people in there that were alive in the 30s and 40s and 50s. It's like, oh, this isn't working. Um, and also, as people get more tired and do more sleeping, starting to consider incontinence care is really important because they still have continence ability, but they may not be able to move fast enough to get to the bathroom in time once they're up. So it's just giving them a little safety and precautions while they're on their way to, you know, it allows them to be continent but incontinent. And um, I remember dear Henrietta, she, when she was first going, you know, recovering from her surgery and she was so humiliated, this is my stepmom, and she said, um, Oh, this is just awful. I'm in this diaper and this is terrible. And I'm just like, oh. And I, and I said, Henrietta, you are still the same elegant, intelligent, sophisticated, lovely woman you have always been. You just need some help in this department. And she went, oh, okay. And so she sort of, sort of settled into it. And by the time we got her home, she was still continent. And after a while, you know, we'd say, well, it's time to check in, change you. You know, it's been several hours. And she said, oh, well, then let me use it. She could totally control when she was using it and not using it, but it was there for her. And then she didn't have to get out of the bed. She didn't have to, she didn't want to go through the effort of going out of the bed. So really understanding that this is to support them um, and give them dignity as their body is needing more support physically. And this is also the time as they're growing weaker and less involved and engaged out in the world, it's that really important time for being with. I know one person that was in our class once said, you know, I spent so much time trying to do for my, my mother-in-law while she was dying that I missed out being with her because she kept trying to do for her and think about the next thing to do for her, the next thing to do for her. We, we so forget about the importance of who we are in our beingness and our quietness and our presence. That's the greatest gift we can give each other and listening. So usually it's really interesting as I've made this parallel between the pregnancy and birth and death and dying that so often this usually takes about a nine month period. In fact, Medicare, it used to be the regulation was, and it still is to some extent, that you prob probably have six months or, or less to live. That's the cutoff point. And usually, you know, if you think about Elaine, the, the woman who said, oh, now I realize I've been sick for a while, that six to nine months out is when they start to start making these real changes that, that I've talked about today. So as they're moving more into the late stage, and this is about one month out, you're really gonna see how they've really changed in their relationship to food. They're really not gonna be too interested in eating. If they have anything, it's gonna be Gatorade. Even, you know, protein drinks are too much at this time. So things like Gatorade, Recharge, those things are okay. Eventually those get to be too much. Ice chips, people love ice chips. It's like mana. They love it. And in, when they're still doing the Gatorade, you can, you know, make ice cubes out of Gatorade and crush them up 
and have ice chips. People love ice chips, Gatorade flavored or just plain. Water, um, but just just go with what they want and it's gonna, they're gonna wanna eat, eat and drink less frequently. Um, the other thing to know is as they're doing more time laying in the bed and, and by the time they're one month out, they're spending a lot of time in the bed, it's really important to consider skin care. People, we've heard about bed sores. Bed sores are not because the sheets are rubbing against the skin, but because a body stays in the same position for too long and blood supply gets cut off to a part of the body. And so the injury comes from the inside, deep by the bone, out to the, to the skin. They're called pressure sores because there's too much pressure unrelieved. So it's really important to turn people every two to four hours. That's real important. Um, and being gentle touch and time, again, that t quiet time to be with. Keep them clean, keep them turned, and then let them eat or drink as they want to. That's all you're gonna need to do. Um, the other thing is that medications are gonna need to be adjusted. As the meds that they were on when they were relatively healthy they're not going to need as they move through their dying process. You know, when we're in our dying process, we don't need to take our statins anymore. We don't need to take our, all our cholesterol medicines or, you know, and the antidepressants. I've, I've watched more and more people get weaned off of those as they move into their dying process. And blood pressure meds, as people get more into being more sedentary, their blood pressures normalize. And so you really have to watch it and wean them off the, the blood pressure meds. Um, certainly diabetics who are on insulin, you just really have to monitor their needs because their, their nutritional status, they're taking in much less depending on what kind of illness they have in their body and whether they're running infection will fluctuate their blood sugars. So those things need to be looked at. But the medication adjustment is a real important part and hopefully people are in hospice at this point and the hospice nurses and physicians can help adjust those meds as they need to. But they will need adjusting and they will need to withdraw to just the core meds. Now, as I said earlier, it doesn't hurt to die. So pain medications are not a given as people are dying. They are not a given. So if there is pain, then people will need to be on pain medications and have those regulated. And the pain's usually created, especially in cancer patients, by the increasing size of the tumor, pressing on nerves and pressing on organs. So that does need to be medicated for comfort. And that's really important to do. And then you have to figure out, well, the, usually the pain meds that people get are constipating, so then you have to pay attention to the bowels because they're not eating as much, they're not moving around, and they are taking medications that are creating constipation. So it's really important to stay on top of the bowels. And um, it's not something we usually talk about in our society. It is critical for people's comfort that they have a bowel movement at least every three to five days. It just has to happen. Um, the other thing that can happen pretty late staged is that as people get more and more um, sedentary in the bed, they can get more secretions that build up, especially if they've got a lung cancer or an oral cancer or something that creates increased sec secretions, they may build up and so there may be medications needed to kind of dry that out. So all those things, the symptoms can be managed by meds. The symptoms can be managed by meds and that's working closely with your hospice team. But just know that the body is still going through a natural process. I, had, I, was, I was so excited to hear a doctor say this. I had a woman who was dying. Um, she'd just been in overall decline. And she had decided she never wanted to go back to the hospital again. And then she woke up one morning and she said to her caregiver, please take me to the hospital. She just got scared. And when she got there, she decided she didn't want to be there. But by this time, her family had arrived in town. And they were thinking, well, maybe we should put in a feeding tube, and maybe we should do this, and maybe we should do that for her. And this physician was so wise and so wonderful. She said to them, you know, I could give her fluids and kind of build her back up again. And we could think about doing some of the things that you're talking about. But her body will still be dying. Nothing's going to change that. 
So let's listen to what she'd like us to do for her. And that's what we did. Instead of trying to fix something as if it was going wrong, we listened to her and we took her home. And she died a couple of weeks later in complete comfort. So it's just respecting the process, the natural process of the body. And I was so excited to hear this doctor just gently be with it. It was just beautiful. Um, the other thing at this point when there's still some strength within the person, it's really important to look at completing with loved ones. All along this process, it's really important to look at completing with loved ones. And that may mean writing a note. It may mean having a phone call. It may mean sitting. It may be that that person that, that the dying person needs to complete with isn't available to do a completion with them. So then that person's work can be done with the chaplain or with the social worker or with a loved one to just work out what that whatever is unhealed in that relationship. So working out things that need to be completed. A lot of times there's forgiveness, you know, those favorite words, um, I forgive you, um, please forgive me, I love you and thank you. Those are the four things that are most important to be said at the end of life. Those are the most important to be said at the end of life. I forgive you, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. So um, eventually p people are going to move into what's called the more, there's the late stage of, of dying. And it's, you know, it's kind of, you're going back and forth, kind of like pregnant women do. They have the Braxton Hicks and, and it's kind of like a false labor. And really when people are in the late stage, they look a little bit like they're going into active dying and the labor of dying and they're not quite, but they're doing a lot of things that are really, really, really different. Um, eventually their voice is going to get really weak and they're not going to be able to, to speak as clearly. So having done that, that work that requires verbal beforehand is much more important and the completion with significant others. Um, and they're going to be, one of the things I know that happens at the end of life and it happens kind of at this point, and then it moves on into the labor stage, is people start to do what we call visioning. They start to see loved ones who have died before. And if people don't understand the dying process, they think people are hallucinating, they think that they're delusional, they get really scared because they'll, they'll you know, I'll, I'll come into a home and they'll say, They've been talking to people who aren't really here, people that aren't really in the room. And Dear Elaine, the one that I was telling you about that went, in, that went into the nursing home and couldn't sleep, and, and she, I walked into her room one day and I said, well, how are you doing? She said, ugh, I'm losing my mind. And I said, well, what's wrong? She said, I'm seeing people who aren't really here. And I said, well, are they people that you know or people that you don't know? She said, well, for the most part, I don't know them. I said, well, who do you know? And she said, well, I don't, for the most part, know them. That told me she did not want to talk about the people she knew. So I said, okay, well, tell me who it is you're seeing. Well, these three young men up there, and she pointed on the wall. And I just said, and this was a woman who loved men and didn't like women very much. So it was perfect, three young men up on the wall. And I said, and again, I didn't want to put my values on it. So I said, well, are they people that you are comfortable with or are they scary to you? You know, are they distressing or comforting? Oh no, they're great. They're great, I'm glad they're here. I said, well, you just need to know that you're not losing your mind, that they're really real, and they're really here for you as part of your dying process. So enjoy them. Now, I have had, it runs the gamut as far as what people see. Um, people usually see deceased relatives, Sometimes mothers who have miscarried or had a child die very young, that child will come. I had one woman come up to me years ago and said, you know who showed up for my dad? His favorite dog. So animals show up. Um, I, I've had people see, um, they just go, who's that, who's that? And they would see people or beings that they didn't know. So it runs the gamut, but usually it's familiar people. When my Aunt Anne was dying, um, my cousin said they could feel her husband, my Uncle Red, in the room. 
I mean, you can feel the presence of these. I don't happen to be sensitive to all this, but I've heard it enough consistently that I know that it's real, it's a real experience. And it lets me know people are getting, when people start saying that they're seeing people, I know they've got about two weeks left in their life. Now, sometimes they can have a lot more time, but that's usually when they start talking about it. I think that they've been seeing him and hearing him for a while, but they just weren't talking about it. And it just gets to the point where, oh, okay, well, it becomes normal. Um, there's a wonderful movie called um, Solace, the Wisdom of Dying. And this, this woman, you know, family would come to visit. And she said, don't sit in that chair. He's sitting there. And it's like, you know, nobody else could see him. But that was a definite visitor for this woman. So we just have to understand. And that does not mean that sometimes people don't hallucinate. And sometimes they do get confused and are not in touch with reality. But it's very clear when that's happening. Very clear. Um, like with Elaine, when she could carry on a perfectly normal conversation. She was just experiencing something I couldn't experience. When people are hallucinating and seeing things, they make no sense in their conversation whatsoever. And that's the difference. And then that may or may not need to be medicated. And again, it's a medical decision. But the actual visioning People are not hallucinating, they're not delusional, and it's a normal part of the dying process. It's just, an, it's part of the spiritual or non-physical reality of dying. Um, so it's really important to support that. So when that starts to happen, they're about ready to move into the labor of dying. So what does the labor of dying look like? Well, labor in a woman who's about ready to birth the baby is marked by rhythmic changes in the uterus. Labor in dying is marked by rhythmic changes in the breathing. Now, most of us have heard of sleep apnea. We know that that means that people stop breathing or take pauses in their breathing when they're sleeping. So what happens in labor, in the labor of dying, people are going to breathe, 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 and then have a period of apnea. And breathe, 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 and have a period of apnea. And this is not when they're going to stop breathing. It, it, people, I cannot tell you how many people have written to me and said, thank God for your book. It, made, it normalized this process, this phase of the dying process. And this one ER doc said, you know, I'd watch people die. I didn't know that this, and they died suddenly and traumatically. And he said, when I read what you wrote and I realized this is just a stage, this is not when people are going to stop breathing. But because there's these big pauses in the breathing, people go, oh, he stopped breathing, he just died. No, that it's just the labor. It's just a phase. They're going to move through that and move into other breathing patterns. So just know that this is the labor, that the breathe, 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 no breath, breathe, breathe, breathe is, very, is part of it. And there's nothing to fix. And this can last from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. It can go on for a long time. And during this time, I believe, and, and, and I believe that when they don't have that breath, they've actually kind of left their body, left the physical body, and they're in the non-physical realm. And there are some people who can see energy fields, and they have confirmed that when people don't take their breath, they can see the motion in their energy field. I know when my dad was dying and he was in the hospital room and I was trying to talk with him, he would go into the apneic period, and I just out of experience, because he was talking, and then all of a sudden he'd do no breath, and I tried to wake him up and get him to respond, and he was just staring ahead, would not respond, and then he'd take a breath, and then we'd resume the conversation. So it's like, not there, there, not there, there. And I do believe that it's part of that traveling that happens because they're, we are getting, they're getting ready to eventually just be here. And it is this breathing that sets it up for us to do that. And the other thing, if you think about it, if you think about it, um, if we've done that much traveling between the physical and the non-physical realm, when we finally die, it's not an unknown. We've been spending time there. And it's real easy to move on over into that energy place. And the other thing to think about, you know that not eating and drinking? You know, if we don't, if, if somebody decides not to eat or drink for maybe a week, 
it's a process that we know about that's called fasting. And if you think about why do people usually fast? Well, they fast either to cleanse or to have a spiritual experience, to prepare for a spiritual experience. The Native Americans who go on vision quests fast for three days before they go on their vision quest or during the time they're on their vision quest. The people who go into monasteries on retreats fast. So many of the religious traditions do fasting as part of enhancing the ability to connect spiritually. And we know that there is a biochemical change in a fasting body and they've tracked it that enhances our ability to have these spiritual experiences. Isn't it amazing that the human body in its dying process naturally goes into a fasting state that supports the dying process? Isn't that amazing? And usually what happens is people will have withdrawn from food and fluid by the time they're in the labor of dying and that they actually refuse to take in food. They lock their lips. Either they can't swallow it because these muscles have gotten too weak or they will not let you put food in. They will lock their lips or spit it out. And so usually from the time a person starts refusing food, it takes about five days to die. Now I have seen it take longer. I have seen some people take three weeks to die. I have had some nurses tell me about people taking six weeks to die, but they, they had held excess fluid on their body because of the lymphedema or the excess fluid that had collected on their body, and they were drawing from the fluid in their body kind of like a camel does. So it's hard to predict. It's hard to predict how it's going to work, but the natural physiology is withdraw from food and fluid. It supports, supports this spiritual or non-physical experience, it supports our bodies doing that. It creates comfort. It enhances the experience of the person. I actually had a, f <coughs> a physician with a person who was very close to death come in and speed up her IV, and she started getting restless and uncomfortable. And I, I walked in, and the nurses on the unit knew, and I said, oh, dear. And so I called the doc. And we just talked and I explained, he said, oh my goodness, I had no idea. He came up, he slowed the IV down, she got to go back into that state that was an altered state of physical reality. So just understanding that this whole process supports us to get, it, to get out of our bodies. Um, so there will be the breathing, the, the, the rhythmic breathing that by this time they're not usually talking so much and they're certainly not interested in eating and drinking and they're mostly laying in the bed doing this in very deep internal process and they need the comfort of the turning and the cleaning and being left in peace. When you walk into a room at this point, you can palpably feel the peace in the room. It is so amazing to feel. Um, so then what's going to happen? That can happen, like I said, for a couple of days or it can happen for a couple of, a couple of weeks. But eventually they're going to come to a place of doing what is called the transition phase. Now when a woman goes from labor into birthing, and again, I've never birthed the baby, but every woman goes, oh yeah, that's what happens. By the time you get to the end of labor, there is this intense restlessness and moaning and groaning, and it's like, my God, if this child doesn't come out, I am going to jump out of my skin. The same thing happens when people are dying. They have gone through the labor, they've gone through the physiologic changes, and all of a sudden they move into this place bo at both stages, at the beginning of life and end of life, it's called the transition phase, and there's this intense restlessness, just this moaning and groaning and picking at things. And I remember when my mother did this and I was 28 years old and I didn't know this, and it was like 10 o'clock at night, it so scared me. I had her home alone in my apartment. I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh my God, I can't stay in the room. She's too noisy. I can't stay out here. Something terrible is going on with her. I didn't know what to do. And there wasn't hospice in those days. So I just thought, okay, in the morning, I'm going to have to take her to the hospital because I can't deal with this if there's something terribly wrong. I had no idea she was going to die at midnight that night, that what she was going through was perfectly normal. It was just scary to me. So there, there can be this moaning and this groaning and this reaching out and this one daughter was next to her mother and her mother was reaching out and the daughter said to her, Mom, what are you reaching out for? And this woman could still talk and she said, pieces of light. So who knows? 
Who knows? We know not. And then we move into um, our active, um, the true deathing period. But before we go there, in, I want to say it's really important for people to understand that on some level, we choose our time of death. We choose our time of death. Now, I'm not saying that we can consciously choose it like you go to the store and pick out which apple you want to buy. <clears throat> it's not that kind of choice. But what I have watched is so very often, and it's the hugest part, the hugest mystery in the dying process to me. It is the hugest mystery because I have watched people and little mama is, God bless her, is my favorite example. Little mama walked off an airplane in Shreveport, Louisiana. Little Floridian woman. I was part of the family. She's part of my family. She walked off that airplane. She hadn't been feeling well. And she walked into the hospital. They did a biopsy on her. I spent the first night with her. And then Paul and Adele, her um, daughter and son-in-law, were with her the second night. And they were visiting with her. And the doctor came in while they were there and said, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Ferguson, we have some bad news. You have lung cancer, pretty advanced lung cancer. And she said, mm, that was all, okay. So that night, Paul and Adele got ready to leave, and they said, good night, little mama. And she said, goodbye, darlings. Mm. And they said, well, little mama, don't say that. Say good night. And she said, goodbye, darlings. That was about 10, 1030. At midnight, little mama was fine. At 1230, the nurse went back in, and she was dead. So what a mystery. How did she do that? Little mama. And I have had other patients who so wanted to die. And they had been in their dying process for such a long time. And my favorite one here is Ferd. Um, and he, again, was one of my favorites. And he, he was this big raw bone Texan. And, and he had, um, he actually had bone cancer and his whole spine had collapsed so he's paralyzed from the waist down and he was he was in the bed i think i met him in october he was in the bed by november and and he declined over those over those months and he said you know i'm ready to die he said i'm not ready to die yet my birthday is january 21st he said but after that i'm ready to die and we said okay so January 21st came and went, and he had not died. And he had not died. And for months he had not died, and he was so frustrated. He said, please, get me out of this bed, drag me to the garage, turn on the car, get me out of here. Why he couldn't die, and little mama, little pistol pack and little mama could get out, I know not why. I've watched other people, oh, I had this one woman uh, who lived up in uh, north of Santa Fe. She was just wonderful. It was her 50th wedding anniversary was coming up. And they'd celebrated it early because they knew she probably wouldn't be able to do it on the day. And the, the morning, uh, one morning she woke up and she said, Hitos, today's the day. Today's our anniversary. And they said, no, mama, it's not till tomorrow. She went, ugh. And she had to wait a day to die. And she died the next day. So I've watched people wait for that special occasion. I've watched people wait for a certain person to walk in the door. I've watched people wait for a certain person or everybody to walk out of the door. When my father was dying, oh, he was, he was something. He taught me so much. He was a physician. He was dying of starvation, basically. People don't die of starvation, but he couldn't absorb any food. Um, because they'd taken his stomach out as a result of ulcer surgery, which they don't do anymore, but back then they did. And um, so basically he had no way of absorbing nutrition. And he was so angry. He wanted to stay in the hospital as Dr. Cope. He did not want to be at home. He didn't, you know. So we took him home. He says, what the hell am I doing here? And I said, well, you know, you can't stay in the hospital. You didn't want to go to a nursing home. You're here. Well, is this where I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life? And I just went, well, yeah, this is where you need to sp spend the rest of your life. Um, and if you want to get better, you know, if you're going to get better, we're here to support you doing that. Um, so he was, he was, 
So anyway, I called the family because all of a sudden I could see like within an hour he went into an active dying process. And I know it's because he was so angry about what was happening to him. And he went into his, I could see the shifts. His voice got weak. All of a sudden his breathing was changing. And I thought, oh my God, you know, he just sh downshifted, boom. So then I called on my family and they came around and we were encircled him and were loving on him and laughing and crying and doing all those things. And all of a sudden he slowed down. And I'm going like, what is going on here? And pretty, and that was like at about six o'clock and pretty soon it was 11 and he'd made the transition in about a half an hour. And about 11 o'clock, I'm going like, whoa, what is happening that he's so slowed down? So then I thought, oh, I know what's happening. So I gathered all my family into the kitchen. Henrietta stayed with him. And I started to say to my family, sometimes people need their loved ones out of the room because they need space to die. They need privacy to die. And I, all I had to do was say the word sometimes people. And Henrietta came out and said he just died. He just needed us out of the room. So for those people who feel so bad because they didn't get there in time, or you know, you could be in vigil with your loved one for hours upon hours and then leave to go answer the phone or leave to go use the bathroom and then they die. And you go, oh, I didn't want them to die alone. We choose our time of death and nobody dies alone. Nobody dies alone. All those beings that knew us before, that love us and have preceded us, on some level, they will be there for us. I tell people, if you die out, you know, if you're lost in the woods for five days and you die out there, you will not die alone. You will have beings show up for you and you will be escorted. And I've learned that from my patients and from my family members who constantly tell me, about who's there for their loved one. And sometimes they just need space. And you know, all that time that they've been sleeping and going back and forth, they've been connecting with those folks. So they're as familiar to them as you are. So just understanding that there's a whole mysterious part, especially at the very end of life, especially at the very end of life. So, they're in the labor of breathing, the labor of dying, and it's in the, the breathing pattern that you're going to see. And then they're going to go into the dying process. They're going to go from that labor. They're going to go through the transition phase, and it's going to be so hard to watch. And then they're going to get to the place where all of a sudden they just get so calmed down, and their breathing gets so regular, and it gets deep and regular, and it's deep down into here. And it may get slower apart, but it's just deep and regular. And first of all, it's breathing down into here. And then it's breathing down up to here. And then pretty soon the breath is only to here. And then pretty soon the breath is to here. And then pretty soon it's... And that's it. That's dying. And if you're in the room, you can feel the energy in the room shift to a deep presence. And you can honor the process by being with that energy. Now what will happen is for beloveds who are there, there's going to be emotions that come up. But that person, that being who has just moved into the non-physical realm is still present. They're still present in that room. It's like having an out-of-body experience, only you don't get to come back in. And any out-of-body experience you've heard about, they will tell you, I could describe who I was or what I was with. The surgeon said, yeah. And then they come back in. I said, you know, I heard you say this and you put this there. And yeah, you're right. So there is an ability to observe from here. And, and then people get to come back in. When we die, we're out here. We're just not coming back in. 
So we in the room need to truly honor that that person's still here. And yeah, you're going to cry. You're going to be emotionally upset. That's understandable. But what I know I did as a young nurse when I didn't know, it was just the body. You start washing it. Who thinks? You don't think about anything. They're dead now. It's, they're just dead. Doesn't matter. I have learned that this is an incredibly reverent, sacred time and to hold that space and energy. And one of the ways to honor that, because so often there is incontinence that happens in the body, that when there's a final dying of the body, a final leaving of the physical, that there is a letting go of urine and the bowels. And so there's going to need to be some cleaning up of the body. And that bathing of the body at the end can be one of the most sacred things to participate in. Now, some of the traditions, such as the Jewish tradition, when we're in hospice, we don't bathe the body. We call those people from the temple who come in and bathe that body according to the Jewish tradition and, and ritual. When I go to pronounce on the Pueblos, I do not bathe the body. I do not touch the body. That is up to the Pueblo. All I do is go in and confirm the fact that this person has died, and then I leave, and the rituals are done, and according to the tradition. So it's really honoring that. And I know um, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and there's quite a large Buddhist community here. And the Buddhists have very strong um, belief systems about the body being touched. And... Um, it's my understanding that if you have to touch a body, and, I've, and some of my families do this even if the person's not Buddhist as kind of a just-in-case, that the first place to touch a body when you have to touch it is on the crown of the head. Because there is a poa that the Buddhists do, and that's where the, that's where the soul leaves from, is out through, through the crown of the head. And if there's touching other parts of the body, then that can interfere with going up to, hopefully, to enlightenment. Um, and, but what I've experienced here, when people are truly deeply Buddhist, they don't want the body touched for at least three hours, or six hours if it can happen. I, and some people, they don't want the body touched for eight days. And there's ways to handle that because the funeral homes here will come and without touching the body, they will pack the body in dry ice and keep it, you know, kind of cool down to where that's okay. The important thing when you're present with somebody who has died is to know what their tradition is and to know that ahead of time. Whatever it is, honor the sacredness of that moment of death and that the person is still present on some level. So that's the dying process as I've learned about it. And I thank you for however you will be called to participate in this sacred process in your life.